Hi dear students, I'm Dr. Denzi Lawrence and today I'll be talking to you about the fundamentals of epidemiology. Now what are the purposes and the uses of epidemiology? The ultimate purpose of epidemiology is prevention of disease and promotion of health. How do you do that? First and foremost, elucidating the natural history of disease. The natural history of disease is the path of progression which a disease takes right from entering the organism or into the host that is in case of an infectious disease or development of risk factors and in the case of non-infectious disease to ultimately the manifestation in the latest form. So natural history for every disease varies. For example, it can be for in cases of malaria, the parasite entering the human body. Now the parasite entering the human body takes a certain times of period to manifest and eventually show the conditions. So natural history of disease today is understood because the elucidation is done by the purpose of epidemiology. So if it wasn't for epidemiology, you wouldn't be having that big paragraph in the beginning of every textbook which tells you about the history of every disease. Second important thing is, it describes the health status of a population. Today, we understand how healthy or how diseased every population or cohort is, is only when we collect the data or the statistics. And all this is done by describing the status of a population in terms of epidemiological terms. For example, the rate, the ratio, the proportion, which I'll be discussing in the future slides. Third, it establishes the determinants of disease. By gathering information which might lead to the disease, you are identifying what is a deterministic factor. To understand this, let's take a simple example of diabetes mellitus. When the epidemiology of diabetes mellitus was studied in detail, it was arrived upon that there are certain few factors which act as independent risk factors. So to begin with, they started identifying the pedontal status of diabetes patients. So you notice that there was a relationship between pedontitis and diabetes mellitus. But as time advanced, it was also known that in certain cases of diabetes mellitus, there was pedontitis. In some cases of pedontitis, there was also diabetes. So you don't know whether it is a one way or a two way directional relationship. But you understand that today, pedontal disease is an independent risk factor for diabetes mellitus. This is only understood because the epidemiology has clearly established what is a determinant and what is a risk factor. And therefore, you are able to tackle the problem of non-communicable diseases in a changing world. And eventually, you are evaluating the intervention's effectiveness. Because when you study the epidemiology of a disease, you study the true evaluation of whether whatever intervention you have provided has worked or not. So the end result evaluation is done only when you have the application of epidemiological principles to the study of all your evaluation programs. So these are the purposes and the uses of epidemiology. Now there are major two categories of epidemiology. The epidemiology which tries to describe the health status is called descriptive epidemiology which is usually restricted to the frequency and the distribution of diseases and health related events. It answers four major questions of how many, who, where and when. Analytical epidemiology goes one step higher and tries to analyze the determinants of health problems where two other major questions are answered as to how and why. So generally epidemiology answers your six major questions of how, who, where, when, how and why. So you must understand that all these questions have to be completely answered only then the purpose of epidemiology is fulfilled. Now there are certain basic epidemiological assumptions which we have to understand. First and foremost, human diseases doesn't occur randomly or by chance. This is something we all are familiar with. Disease, if it occurs, there has to be a reason for it or there has to be a condition for it or there has to be a conducive environment for it or there has to be an established risk factor. So remember, there is nothing random in being healthy and there is nothing random in being diseased as well. And human diseases usually have causal and preventive factors. That means there is one particular agent in terms of infectious diseases or one particular risk factor in terms of a non-communicable disease. But there is always a causative factor. So it is more of a cause and an effect relationship. Now when you have understood this, automatically you intervene this at this point of time. So there is a probability of preventing it before it happens. So along with epidemiology of disease, the importance to prevention is also increased because once you've established this relationship, automatically the cause and effect, you can intervene by preventing at the right point of time with the right application of measure. 
Basic features of epidemiology include that studies should be conducted on human populations. You must examine the patterns of events in the people. It can establish a cost-effect relationship without the knowledge of the biological mechanism. Now, go back to your sanitary awakening example which I gave you a few slides ago. The great sanitary awakening actually happened at a point of time when John Snow who is identified as the father of epidemiology discovered okay he was able to identify that there is something in the water which is because of it was contaminated that people in London were falling sick remember at that point of time the causative organism for that disease which was cholera as I identified later was not even known to people at that point of time that means in some cases even before we can understand what is the agent behind the disease, we are already understanding the cause and effect relationship and eventually London passed some acts related to public health development and public health regulations. So we were able to counter a disease even before actually looking at it under a microscope which happened much much later. So this is why epidemiological evidence you know contributes significantly and beyond what can actually be measured or tangible in terms of the outcome. Fourth important point here is it covers a wide range of conditions. Now because it takes into account health and health related events, you end up throwing light or focus on many other kind of conditions. So when you're studying about dental caries, you also study about saliva, you study about the agent factors, S mutants and epidemiological causations, all of these things. So it throws open a lot of information on many other conditions which is ultimately beneficial for the development of science. And finally, like I told you, epidemiology is only a comma and never a full stop. It is an advancing science which keeps on going by leaps and bounds due to the advances in the field and fraternity. Now let's try to understand the communicable disease epidemiology. First and foremost communicable diseases are cause the identification is very well known. So cause for a disease is one particular agent like in cases of cholera it was Vibrio cholerae or in case of tuberculosis it's Mycobacterium tuberculae. Any event or condition or characteristic that comes before the disease without which the disease will not occur. So if I have to see a case of tuberculosis I must be able to collect a sample of that particular organism in that person without which the disease cannot occur. So communicable disease epidemiology is relatively simple to understand. What causes actually disease? Now there are many theories which have been proposed starting from the 19th century theories to something being contagious or the supernatural theory as something present in the spirits or, or the wishes of the ancestors or personal behavior or miasma the theories of diseases. So there have been many theories which have been proposed to explain disease for a very long period of time. Theories have advanced from the 19th to 20th century where they talk about a germ theory, a lifestyle theory, environment theory and multicausal. So we started with identifying few diseases which could be easily explained with the presence or an absence of a certain agent. But later on we understood that there are certain environmental factors. Now, environment factors like poor sanitation, poor environmental conditions like the surrounding climate changes, all of these have a reflection. And environmental conditions cannot completely explain the diseases like diabetes mellitus or dental caries, but there are multitude factors. So from a germ theory or from a biomedical approach, we've come to a holistic approach of multi-causality which is seen in our case. This brings us to a preposition of what is necessary and what is sufficient. Now necessary means the disease will not occur without the presence of the factor. That means if there is no mycobacterium TB, there is no development of tuberculosis. Sufficiency means the presence of the factor will always result in the disease. That means rabies virus for development of rabies. So this is a constant interplay between necessary and sufficient. Next important thing is the etiology of a disease. Now all the factors when you sum it up which ultimately lead to the contribution or the occurrence of a disease is nothing but the etiology of a disease. So you take the agent factors, you take the host factors and you take the environment factors eventually is the etiology of a disease. Now let me take an example of an epidemiological triad for you. Now in this epidemiological triad let me take the agent which is placed here, let me take the host and we take the environment. Now the disease under display here is dental caries. Now I'm giving you a dental example so that it becomes more relevant for you so you can understand this better. Now what is the agent for dental caries? All of us know that it is the S mutants species. 
What is the host? It is definitely the tooth which is anchoring and which is causing eventually prone to decay. Then there is the environment which is the substrate which is the food which is left behind the food particles which ultimately act upon the substrate for the disease to occur. Now all of these three factors in context with time explains the development of dental caries. That means each of these are one of the risk factors but each of these cannot cause the disease on its own. So when I say the etiology of a disease you must be able to understand that agent, host and environment all play an equal and important role in the development of disease and that is the reason why this representation is called an epidemiological triad. This clearly explains that etiology is a sum of agent, host and environment factors for any disease for that matter we have to understand.